Hey, Micah Black. Some people think that when we rap, we ain't praising, we ain't worshiping. Well, you got it wrong, man. I'm looking to heaven for my help, for real. Christians can be servants of mammon Our cabinets are full while the homeless get deserted and famine Nah, this is not how it's supposed to be Haves and a half, not so greedy, I'm selfish openly It's an abomination, just what the prophet spoke to me That's why the wife of the lamb in Revelation we hope to see Which is a description of heaven on earth You wanna enter it, you gotta have a second birth That's what Jesus told Nicodemus when I read the verse That's why we evangelize and try our best to spread the church Lord, remember, he said that there be no more hunger Tell that there be no more pain Righteousness reigns forever Tell me what's that gonna be like We wonder what that's gonna be like Yeah Tell that there be no more crying Wiping those tears away No more death John is on the mountainside. He saw the heavenly Jerusalem coming from the sky. A magnificent and glorious wonder to the eyes. Streets paved with transparent gold. I want to get inside. Twelve pearl gates around the city. Three on every side. Inscribed on each one is a name from the twelve tribes. Forever in the presence of God would dwell the wise. The whoremongers, idolaters, or those who tell the lies. Some of us won't make it and he gave us all chances. The kings of the nations combined, we holding palm branches. No more questions, cause Christ is giving all answers. No more disease, get rid of viruses. Is that all cancers? Man, in this life, I have been a fool. So dirty, I left a ring around that baptism pool. But he cleansed you through the blood. Now I am a different dude. When I knock, I pray he opens. I don't want to get refused. Uh uh. He said that there be no more hunger. He said that there be no more pain. Righteousness reigns forever. Tell me what's that gonna be like? We wonder what that's gonna be. Wiping those tears away No more death then, no more lying Tell me what's that gonna be like We wonder what that's gonna be Oh, Mike was muted. What's good? What's good? God bless y'all. Good evening. Shabbat shalom. Welcome. Welcome. Ah, uh, yes. It is another Friday night, folk. You know what I'm saying? And in, in, uh, 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 in the words of the great prophet Johnny Kemp, just got paid. It's Friday night. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, God bless you and your households, man. What's up with y'all? I hope everyone is in good spirits. I pray that your week hasn't been overly vexing. And I'm hoping that uh, the presentation that I'm thinking about tonight will be edifying, even though I know that a lot of you are overly familiar with most of the stuff that I spew. Anyway, 
So good evening and welcome to the Bible Dojo. Once again, it's your brother Zadok Ben Israel, a.k.a. the God Hop MC hashtag, just the best of nobody special, a.k.a. Young Chimney Ben Kitor. What's good with y'all? Huh? Yeah, the dojo is open. So y'all come on up in here. Take your shoes off. Check your sock game. Make sure you're on point. And let's start these warm up cotters because it's about to get biblical again. You heard. Yes, yes, yes. So salute to everybody tapping in through the clubhouse. Those of you tapping in through Facebook and YouTube as well. I hope all is well. So I see a few of you are already sending shaloms my way. Cam to player peace with blessings. Salute, salute. Thank you. Shalom. Hako Dash in the building. What's good with you, Brody? Davion Murphy. Salute to you, family. Octavio Arahu. What's good? I haven't seen that name in a while. Salute to you. Welcome. Nino Light was mobbing with you. Ben Cole was good with it. This beat fire hook crazy. I'm watching something and this hook was playing in the background. I don't know how. I was like, who this didn't realize it was this video? Hey, salute, salute. No doubt, no doubt. <clears throat> Is it out yet? Hey, that's actually from an old project that I'm looking uh, to. I thought it was going to be remastered already, but the summer been so crazy and busy hasn't happened yet. But that's part of a re-release. That's from an album from 2016 called Freedom. And that song in particular is named New Jerusalem. And a lot of people like it. That's why I thought about resurrecting the project. I just was like, I think this would be one of the dope songs for an intro. And then people started asking for the song. So most high willing, it will be around sooner than later. But thanks for asking. Thanks for the support. Q's Visions Films or Case Visions Films. But either way, salute. What's going on with it? Dwayne Butler. Welcome, King. Salute to you. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Hakodesh. Sister V Love. Hello, hello. Marcus Jones in the building was good with you. Most high bless you and yours, family. Gregory Sharp, welcome this evening. Yes, yes, yes. Yah saves grace. Salute, King. Was good with it. All right, all right, all right. Uh, can this do it for the nation, by the way? Oh, okay. See, I wouldn't know. You you get you you come with that name. That's the name I'm gonna say. <laughs> but I, okay, I'm familiar with that. You just changed the uh the handle. But salute to you. Welcome to everyone. Unorthodox daughter of Zion. Welcome. I see it's a couple people over on the clubhouse app. Salute the service. Salute the set. Bless you, brothers. Um. So brethren, y'all know what it is. Y'all know how we get down. You know how we move. Let me bring my bro up. Who's helping this evening? It's my brother from another mother. What's good with it, Ken? What's the dealio, Emilio? <laughs> Salute, Brody. Appreciate your volunteerism. Absolutely glad to be here, bro. No doubt, no doubt. I know you just uh sliding up in the young building. You see, you see? look at me you're getting it all situated in 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, bro. That's what's up. So, yeah, you be ready in a sec. I know you got a couple little ones and twos around you, but yeah, appreciate you. I Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, brethren, ah, tonight, by Yah's grace, I want to put something on the table. And believe me, this isn't really super deep at all. But we uh, we usually talk about Abraham and we usually use the title that's kind of cliche in church culture. Abraham, the father of the faithful. And what's interesting is, of course, we know where it comes from. Like, you know, Yeshua told the children of Israel who were against him and weren't accepting his mission that, you know, they weren't of their father. They were of their father, the devil, and weren't truly the children of Abraham. And then we know the apostles talk about being the children of Abraham. So uh, by proxy, those who would consider themselves sons and daughters of Abraham by faith would consider him the father of the faithful. But there's actually a term that's used toward him, and it's very interesting. It is literally used in this sense, the friend of God or the friend of Elohim. That is a very interesting narrative. And remember this, you'll only find that term one time in the scriptures. 
as far as I found that you don't, you don't find that term written all over the scriptures, right? It's in James' letter. And what is interesting is it puts you in mind of the fact that they were in tune with some things that we don't, in the majority of cult, church culture, there are resources that might still be available to us, but a lot of people don't use them in depth. When you're sitting in church or class or your congregation or your camp, sometimes, depending on who your teachers are, your idea of what it takes to understand the scripture might be limited or, ex or, or expansive. It really depends on who you decide to sit among, who you decide to sit under, and what it is that they know so that when they share, they're turning you on to different sources. There's this phrase that has become popularized by reformed circles and many other people adopt it as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. And that is this phrase, sola scriptura, meaning scripture alone. Brethren, that's not scripture. <laughs> that's, a, a, that's a mantra. I get it. That's a statement. That's a, that's a conclusionary more decisional concept under certain people's tradition. Now, don't get it twisted. It is the word that I look to in order to understand. But how many of you could tell someone that Christ's uh, prophecy of Jerusalem being surrounded by armies and being destroyed happened? You can't read it in the scripture. You can read where he says, hey, Jerusalem, this place is going to be destroyed, but your, it's not scripture alone. You have to go to extra biblical sources. You got to go to secular history and teach people about what happened to Jerusalem. You have those who teach, uh, hey, by tradition, there's a claim that when, 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 uh, 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 um, as, as the Romans were coming to Jerusalem, that there was a, a, a the Holy Spirit had given a prophecy in the church by someone who worked in the prophetic, warning them of what was to come and that they allegedly got out of Jerusalem before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, the believers, and they fled about 60, 70 miles away to a city south of Judea called Pella. Oh, yeah? Can you establish that in the scriptures? Or do you have to go outside the scriptures to even believe or put on the table this concept? You have to go outside the scriptures. So the things that we need to know, even to corroborate and confirm that certain things did happen or not, we have to go outside of the text. So our wisdom and understanding of, it's not just about what God said, it's also about what are we still to look for? What are some things we might mistakenly be looking for and they've already happened? We can use history as well. There's also something that is a gift to the church and that gift that can uh, uh, give the church more knowledge and more understanding on certain things is prophecy. Now you got foretelling prophecy which is the idea of the prophets who were sent by God to tell the people what they were doing wrong and how they need to repent. They didn't, they didn't necessarily have to give a prediction. They just came and said, Hey, the Lord upset y'all doing evil. He said, repent. Now with that could be a mix of foretelling, meaning if y'all don't stop, the Lord said, he's going to do this and do that. Right? So like when the most high told him about the Babylonian coming, that would have been something in its time that, wouldn't have been written in the scrolls. That would have been something that they were being told right then and there. We read them in the book after the fact. You understand what I'm saying? But in the days of Jeremiah, when he was warning the people, he would have been telling them about this. In the time of Isaiah, when Isaiah was saying it, it was the future still to come. You understand what I'm saying? So once it happened, we read about the foretelling of it, it happening. Then we get the post-Babylonian narrative, Ezra, Nehemiah. You get the Esther story um, in the Persian Empire. So 
what I'm saying is, is that the idea of this a solar scriptura is limited because what it says is, is that anything you need to know and understand about God's will and how it manifests is only written in the scriptures. And that's not true. And I'm going to start here and I want to see how this goes. So, Brother Kenny, let's go ahead and get into this, sir. So, I want to start this off in the book of where I want to start. Let's start off in the book of James, James chapter two. Oh, and I should have did this already. I'm slacking in my slack, slacking in my computer wisdom here. Let me share the screen. James chapter two. Okay, here we go. So, all right, we're going to go to James 2, bro. And make sure you are mute, Kenny, because you start reading and you, you don't even realize you're stranded on mute island. <laughs> James 2, and when we get there, brother, let's start reading around. Here we go, verse 18. James 2 and 18. James 2 and 18. Here we go. Yea, a man, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the, upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Can any a a a a a Kenny? Are you familiar with the scripture that makes the statement that Abraham is the friend of God? You know where that's at. You mean like if I went in the Old Testament, like would I see it? Like yeah, or something. I mean, I ain't seen it. Might be in there. Oh, <laughs> now. There is something here in the scripture, but it's a statement. And what I'm going to argue is, is that we have to consider where the statement comes from. So let's go here, good brother. Let's go to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Okay, now when we get to Second Chronicles chapter 20, let's start reading around. Okay, this is Jehoshaphat praying to the Most High. Start at verse 3. Second Chronicles 23. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all of the cities uh, of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might? so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of his land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? Oh, there it is. And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment 
or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. Hallelujah. So now as the king is praying to the Most High to have help or, or to be a help to the nation, notice what he says. Are not you our Elohim who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? Now, this is the first place that I find in the scripture where Abraham by another person is being referenced as being the most high's friend. Now, of course, in my short sightedness, I could have missed it, right? I could have missed it. But brethren, where does this come? What gives them the unction to claim that a, a man is God's friend? Now, Abraham, great. F from what we read and believe, great man. But you don't just call somebody God's friend. The thing, I, the closest thing I have found was when, when God said uh, in the wilderness about Moses, when he rebuked uh, uh, Miriam and Aaron, he said, I speak with Moses face to face like a man speaks with his friend. So, okay. But that term in James letter, he says, Abraham was the friend of God. And then here we see the king of uh, Israel praying to the most high, asking him to have mercy on the people because they are the seed of his friend, Abraham. That's very interesting. Now, I'm going to make a claim. It seems to me more than likely that this title on Abraham is one of tradition, meaning that the Israelites were being told this narrative about the great father, Abraham, and somewhere in that narrative, whoever the original tellers of the story are, Abraham, the tradition of Abraham passed among the Hebrews as him being the friend of God, the friend of the Most High. Mm. This is interesting because there's something that I believe is said about Yeshua. Let's go over to the book of Mark right quick. Mark chapter 14. And when we get to Mark chapter 14, I want to start reading here. This is Yeshua talking to his disciples, right? And start at verse 22. Mark 14, 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and when he gave and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. Mm. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily, I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And when they had sung in him, they went out in into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them. All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that, I am risen. I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Mm. But he spake the more vehemently. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I, while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John. Okay, that's good enough. So we see here that Yeshua is talking to them. This is that night of Passover, the night before he uh, uh, gives his life. And he talks about wanting to share the Passover with them, but he wouldn't do this again with them until he did it new in his kingdom, right? 
it says, and when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, as they go out there, Yeshua makes this statement. All of you will be offended because of me this night, because it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And then we know, of course, Peter was like, not me. I ain't running. I ain't going to leave you. Brethren, Yeshua is quoting. He said, for it is written. Right, Kenny? Let's actually see where this is written. Let's go to the book of Zechariah. I believe Zechariah 13. Yes, Zechariah 13. And here we go. Verse four, Zechariah 13 and four. Zechariah 13 and four. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied. Neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive, but he shall say, I am no prophet. I am in husbandman. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, those with those which with I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mm. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Y'all see this is what Yeshua is quoting from. Prophetically, he says, this night, all of you going to be offended because of me, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He didn't quote that last part. And I will turn my hand upon the little ones. That was going to happen to them later. But brethren, check this out. When you look at the text here, if Yeshua would have, would have quoted it all, look at what Yah says. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man that is my fellow. That word fellow, what does that mean? Let's go right here in the tools. If you could see this, Kenny, it, 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 is the, it is the Hebrew word amit. And when you look at this, what does it say here? Look at uh, the Strong's definition. What does it say there? Can you see that? I'm on, I'm on my phone. Hold on. Associate, fellow, relation, perhaps originally feminine. Um, always suffix a man, my fellow, elsewhere only in Leviticus, all at the top. Uh, uh, yeah, relation, neighbor, associate, fellow. Okay, so and uh, on here, the root, uh, here it says, uh, from a primitive root meaning associate, so the root it comes from is associate, but when you look at the fullness of the word companionship, comrade a kindred man one like yourself a comrade a friend y'all know that's enough that's a sin a comrade is a synonym for friend so who look at what is being said about yeshua in his relation to god if the prophecy fits the way yeshua said to the disciples it is written i will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered but in the prophecy, that shepherd is called, he said, I will turn the sword against the man that is my comrade, the man that is my companion, my friend. That's what that saying there. So for those of us who are believers in Hamashiach, we can kind of see because of his nature that the word fellow in that prophecy could fit him. That this shepherd who the Most High is going to smite, this shepherd in particular is a man that's his friend. This same title is used on Abraham, the friend of Elohim. And so when James says, look, Abraham believed God to the point he was willing to even do what he said when it came to Isaac. And he was imputed righteousness because of what he did. Not just that he merely believed in his heart, but he was willing to go through it, through with it. He had the action that backed up the fact that he was 
he was obedient and he trusted in the most high fully. And if, for those of you who know the writer of Hebrews claims, shoot, Abraham believed in God so much, he in faith would have did what the most high told him to do to his son because he believed that God could raise the man from the dead. Look at this. I want to take you all to something. And the reason that I'm going to go here is because I believe that this comes out of the tradition of the Hebrews. You don't find anywhere in Genesis in Abraham's life where he was called a God's friend. But people, you could see where the tradition would come from because of what seemed to be that relationship narrative between Abram and his faith and belief in the Most High, right? Now, let's go and look at something right quick. Let me stop sharing. I'm going to put Josephus on the screen. And the reason I'm going to do this is because with him coming from the house of Kohath and being from the house of Levi and coming from the school of the Pharisees, what he's going to state here, I believe, comes from a longstanding tradition of the Israelites who had a whole mythos about Abraham that we're not commonly taught in the church today. We, I've never, in all my years in church culture, when I was around people and they talk about Abraham, you know, I read Genesis and all of that, but to give the depiction of the kind of person he was outside of what you read in Genesis, that comes from tradition. And I want to show you what, and now remember you, it's, it's on you to be like, oh, I can rock with that source or you reject it. Some people be like, I don't be into them books. I, I only read what's written in the scriptures. More power to you. More power to you. But I'm going to let you know it's stuff even in your New Testament that only could come from other sources outside of what you call canon today, at least in the Western canon that most of us are used to buying in the stores when you go buy the Bible, the 66 books. So I, I want to go ahead and read this because I believe this is what the same education Paul would have come from. And seeing that the Pharisees are, were the lead educators of the entire nation in the time of Yeshua, I believe this is the kind of narrative he would have heard about Abraham as a kid. This is what he and all his apostles growing up in that society, something similar to what we're about to read about Abraham would have been their common education. So it wouldn't have been sola scriptura in the modern sense. And the reason I say that is because some of these cats don't accept other books as being scripture. They even take the word scripture out of context. The word scripture just mean writings. So it could be scripture. Now you may say, I don't think it's so holy scripture, but it could still be scripture because all scripture isn't necessarily coming from a prophet. You could have just had wise men in the people who wrote out the history and the traditions of the people. And once it's written, that is script. They make the word scripture even only contextual to this damn box. And it's not. The apocryphal writings, the pseudepigraphal writings are scripture. Now, if you want to argue, all right, is it all divinely inspired? Well, the book of First and Second Maccabees wouldn't be holy scripture, but it would be scripture. It would be historical scripture, right? The book of Esther. Brethren, there is no thus saith the Lord's in the book of Esther at all. Why is the, is the book of Esther holy scripture? What's the name of the prophet who wrote it? I'm going to argue that the Esther story is just can, 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 by many in their time, would have probably been on the level of what we're about to read. It was part of the historical mythos and the teachings of the people. So with that being said, whether you accept it or not, I'm just laying out that premise. Let's go to Josephus. Antiquities of the Jews, book one. And I want to, hold on. We get past the flood right quick. Tower of Babel, Noah, the colonies. Hold on. Okay, so Abraham is being called out of his father's house, right? So with that being the case, let's go to 
section five under hold on what what under chapter six book one let's go to section five can you see this nate are you able to see that i got my tv on so once the delays once you stop all right i see it hold okay, on okay go ahead good brother all right give me a second it's coming boom section five all right i will now treat of the hebrews the son of phalig oh hold on bro hey bro where's that sound coming from is that coming from your tv Ooh. no because i hear it i hear the double yeah let me mute it right quick okay no problem yeah, that's definitely coming from the TV because that's a severe delay right there. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's all good. No, here we go. We're good now, money. All right, I will now. I will now treat of the Hebrews, the son of Phalig, whose father was Heber, was Ragol, whose son was Serug, to whom was born Nahor, to his son was Terah, who was the father of Abraham, who according who accordingly was the tenth from Noah. It was born in the 292nd year after the deluge. For Terah begat Abraham in his 70th year. Nahor begat Haran when he was 170 years old. Nahor was born to Serug at his 132nd year. Regal was had Serug at 130. At the same time, also Phalig had Regal. Heber had begat Phalig in his 134th year, he himself being begotten by Salah when he was 130 years old, whom Arphaxad had for his son at the 135th year of his age. Arphaxad was the son of Shem and born 12 years after the deluge. Now Abraham had two brethren, Nahor and Haran. Of these, Haran left a son, Lot, also, as also Sarah and Milcah, his daughters. Now, and no, wait, 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 hold on. Where do you get Milcah and Sarah's names in any detail like this in the scripture? You don't. You don't, you, you don't, until a, she's only mentioned in the context of where she's mentioned. When, a, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, her leaving with Abraham, but where's Milka, the daughter of Terah, or the daughter of um, Haran, his brother? So, according to according to this, Abraham married his niece. His niece, his brother's daughter, became his wife. Interesting. Continue. And died among the Chaldeans um, in a city of the Chaldeans called Ur. And his moment is show, and his monument is showed to this day. These married their nieces. Nahor married Milka, and Abraham married Sarai. Now Terah, now Terah, hating Chaldea on account of his mourning for Haran, they all removed to Haran of Mesopotamia where Terah died and was, buried. and was buried when he had lived to be 205 years old for the life of man was already by degrees diminished and became shorter than before till the birth of Moses and after whom the term of human life was 120 years okay cool no that's cool that's cool so Look at the narrative being set up. Now, let's get down to Abram's story more in depth in chapter seven here. Go ahead, good brother. Already. Now, Abraham, having no son of his own, adopted Lot, his brother Haran's son. You're going to have to scroll up a little bit. And his wife Sarai's brother. And he left the land of Chaldea when he was 75 years old. And... At the command of God w went into Canaan and therein he dwelt himself and therein he dwelt himself and left it to his posterity. He was a person of great sagacity, both for understanding all things and persuading his hearers and not mistaken in his opinions. Hold on. How do we know this to be true? 
how can we accept Josephus from the house of Kohath? He from the same house John the Baptist is from. And he's born, he's a part of the generation after John the Baptist. Because if I'm not mistaken, I believe history has Josephus born around 10 CE, allegedly. So he's growing up under the same, Christendom would have been taught this same kind of narrative on Abraham. This is why this is important. Whoever don't accept this, that's a, that's a you issue. Work it out yourself. But I'm telling you right now, when you go into some of the other writings that may not be a part of normal canon, at least learn the concept of some of the mythos that the people had that you may not just find written out in this detail. There is nothing, not one place in Genesis where you will find Abraham had a great understanding persuading his hearers and not mistaken in his opinions. Continue, sir. Where I leave off? Uh, for this reason? Yeah, for this, yep. for which reason he began to have higher notions of virtue than others had. And he determined to renew and to change the opinion, uh, to change the opinion all men happened to have then to have concerning God. For he was the first that ventured to publish this notion that there was but one God, the creator of the universe, and that as to other gods, and that as to other gods, if they contributed anything to the happiness of men, that each of them afforded it only according to his appointment and not by their own power. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> yeah, I hear that silence. How many of you now, for those of you who might have some of this stuff, of course, you've read this already, but there's probably a lot of brethren in the audience who may not have heard this legend or this tradition about Abraham. Look at all of this detail. You ain't going to read none of this in Genesis. So when you hear Jehoshaphat in his prayer in Second Chronicles chapter 20 say, most high, help us. Aren't you? you you're, we are the seed of Abraham, your friend. Then James in his later, I mean, in his letter says, Abraham was the friend of God. Where does that concept come from? It comes from tradition that we aren't taught with this kind of depth in church culture. And because it may not have a prophet's name written on it, most people would be taught that this is something that isn't really important. Well, depends on who you ask. But at any rate, go ahead and continue, good brothers. So wait, 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 hold on. Y'all, who can prove this? Abraham was the first man on, an, on this side of the flood after the separating of nations. He was the first one to go around telling everybody it's only one God, creator of the universe. And that all of these gods that he see men worshiping, that, yo, if these gods are anything, anything they may have done to contribute to the happiness of man was not of their own power. That's an amazing claim because you can't read it in the scriptures or what we call the scriptures. Continue, good brother. This, his opinion, was derived from the irregular phenomenon that were visible both at land and sea, as well as those that happened to the sun and moon and all the heavenly bodies. Thus, if he... Wait, 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 hold on. So now Joseph is going to claim Abraham said something. <laughs> go ahead. If, said he, go ahead. If, said he, these bodies had power of their own, they would certainly take care of their own regular motions. But since they do not preserve such regularity, they make it plain that insofar as they cooperate to our advantage, they do it not of their own abilities, but as they are subservient to him that commands them to whom alone, we ought justly to offer our honor and thanksgiving. For now you can wait, hold on. Now you can see where, if this claim is true, then this man, if he's the one who's among the mess of see brethren, this is an interesting legend because the lands where Abraham are, 
are all full of deity, pantheon deity worship. Egypt, Canaan, and all of Mesopotamia. Go and look at all of the, uh, 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 the legends of the Sumerians and the Akkadians and the Elamites and the original Arameans and all of them. Then go into Kemet. Look at all of this. It So the claim of the Hebrews is, well, Abram said these things as he mingled among, and, and this is what's interesting in the biblical narrative. Notice how Abraham was a man who, because he gained wealth, he was always coming into proximity of the ruling class of every people. The king Abimelech, king Abimelech, the pharaoh of Egypt at that time. Then in Canaan, the princes and rulers of Canaan came to him and said, you're a prince among us. So let us have a truce among us so that if we have invaders come into the land, you'll assist us and we'll assist you. Then when Abraham died, the biblical narrative says when Abraham died, the leaders of Canaan came to him and gave him condolences for his pop, Abraham, and said, your dad was a prince among us and we're willing to have the same relationship with you we had with him. That's interesting because it, it takes it, of course, it don't take it outside the realm of Abraham talking with any and everyone, but notice how he would have been in a position to have these conversations with kings who sit on thrones who might consider themselves God-like with the priesthoods and the aristocracy of these nations he's coming involved with. Remember, if Sarah is in Pharaoh's house and they think this is his sister, he's being treated like a brother. He's among, what, what, what are them conversations like? When he's among Abimelech, and them, what are these conversations like? If we can accept this mythos. Okay, good brother. So go ahead and continue there where it says, for which doctrines? For which hold doctrines? On, hold, hold, hold on, hold on, I'm gonna move it up. Hold on, let me, let me move it. Okay. For which doctrines when the Chaldeans and other people of Mesopotamia raised a tumult against him, he thought fit to leave that country it's now scrolling, and at the moment, uh, and at, at the, the moment, and by the assistance of God, he came and lived in the land of Canaan. And when he was there settled, he built an altar and performed a sacrifice to God. Barosus mentions our father Abram, without making, without naming him, when he says thus. In the 10th generation after the flood, there was among the Chaldeans a man righteous and great and skilled in the celestial science. Okay, whoever Barosus is, he's naming this guy as a historian of mm. a past time, meaning that, remember, y'all, they had writings like the stuff that was at Timbuktu, the stuff that was at the great uh, library of Alexandria, the stuff that they even had in Jerusalem, writings of the fathers. They are dealing with things that simply aren't always a part of our common knowledge. Some of this stuff may not even be, isn't even necessarily part of some other writings, some of the more apocryphal writings uh, um, that the children of Israel had. These could have been from even other sources. But continue, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but Hecateus does more than barely mention him. For he composed and left behind him a book concerning him. Mm. Nicholas of Damascus, in the fourth book of his, his, his history, says thus, Abram reigned at Damascus, being a foreigner who came with an army out of the land above Babylon, called the land of the Chaldeans. But after a long time, he got him up and removed from that country also with his people and went into the land then called the land of Canaan, but now the land of Judea. And this, when his posterity were become a multitude, uh, as to which posterity of his, we relate their history in another work. 
Now, the name of Abram is even still famous in the country of Damascus, and there is showed a village named from him, the habitation of Abraham. Of See, Abram. This, this is stuff that's beyond us, and people can call it a lie. You can crap on it. You can say it don't matter, whatever. But the reason that I wanted to, uh, uh, um, um, the reason that I wanted to read a little bit of that is because it gives us an idea of how the children of Israel looked at Abraham as a unique individual among everyone of his time. That this may be a part of the reasoning they had on why Yah chose him as the descendant of Eber coming out of Shem's bloodline. Now go ahead and continue, brother. We're going to go right over into chapter eight and it's going to start to give this legend on how Abram, on what moved Abraham to Canaan in detail on how things went, where we get a synopsis, a very quick shot. In Genesis, they have a history that gives uh, an expansive narrative. Go ahead, brother. I I got thrown off by Black Tassel talking about the king. <laughs> anyway, now after this, when a famine had invaded the land of Canaan and Abraham had discovered that the Egyptians were in a flourishing condition, he was disposed to go down to them, both to partake of the plenty they enjoyed and to become the auditor of their priests and to know what they said concerning the gods, designing either to follow them if they had better notions than he or hold, to hold on, hold on, hold on. This is a to become an auditor of their priests and to know what they said concerning the gods. So is Abraham here at these places and he here, man, it's wealth here. So he going to go there and he's interested in, you know, probably getting the bag. But he also want to conversate with the priestly class of the land and the nobility to see what their notions are concerning the deity because he wanted to see if they might have had ideas that impressed him in contrast to how he thought about the or there being only one God. Remember, according to the narrative. Go ahead and continue, good brother. All right. Designing either to follow them. Designing either to follow them if they had better notions than he or to convert them in a, into a better way if his own notions proved the truest. Now, seeing he was to take Sarah Sarai with him and was afraid of the madness of the Egyptians with regard to women, lest the king should kill him on occasion of his wife's great beauty, he contrived this device. He pretended to be her brother and directed her in a dissembling way to pretend the same, for he said it would be for their benefit. Now, as soon as they came into Egypt, it happened to Abram as he supposed it would, for the fame of his wife's beauty was greatly talked of, for which reason Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would not be satisfied with what was reported of her, but would needs see her himself and was preparing to enjoy her. But God put a stop to his unjust inclinations by sending upon him a distemper, a distemper and a sedition against his government. And when he inquired of the priests how he might be freed from these calamities, they told him that his miserable condition was derived from the wrath of God upon account of his inclinations to abuse the stranger's wife. He then, out of fear, asked Sarai who she was and who was and who it was that she brought along with her. And when he had found out the truth, he excused himself to Abram that supposing the woman to be his sister and not his wife, he set his affections on her as desiring an affinity with him by marrying her, but not as incited by lust to abuse her. He also made him a large present in money and gave him leave to enter into conversation with the most learned among the Egyptians from which conversation his virtue and his reputation become became more conspicuous than they had been before. Okay, okay, okay. So as we see here, Abram finds himself in these various positions and he starts to gain a reputation. 
But do y'all, a hey, 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 Nate, as you look at this mythos about Abram, is there anything about it in particular that's a common thread you see behind the story in the claim on how the Israelites may have been teaching their people about the story of Abraham? Well, first, let me say, I don't see any inconsistencies, but definitely with him being like, yo, this is not my wife. This is my sister. Um, and, you know, handing them off, to, you know, to the Pharaoh and, and hoping that, that they don't kill him, you know? Okay. Main thing so far. You know what I see? That Abraham was evangelizing about the one true God. Mm -hmm. Among the Mesopotamians. Basically, the claim is he was preaching about there being only one God who was the creator of all life in the universe that eventually he he got he became annoying to the Mesopotamians he was among. And eventually he left that land, especially after the death of his father. And he don't went ahead and went into Canaan. And when he get to Canaan and hear about Egypt, he goes into Egypt. And the claim is he wanted to talk to the priestly class. He wanted to hear what their understanding of the gods were because maybe they had some ideas he needed to consider. And if and, and, and if he thought so, he'd be willing to entertain it or also have the opportunity to persuade some of them to see his concepts as being truer than theirs. And then after he goes through this whole process, and now that's familiar to people, just that little bit. Pharaoh, somehow Pharaoh was alerted that that's the man's wife. Oh, he saw her playing with him or whatever. And then the story goes here. So after Pharaoh blessed him, because he didn't want no smoke from the gods, because even they had the sense of understanding that adultery was evil, even though in their land, men were known to kill a man and take his woman. This narrative is interesting that it claims he gave him leave to do what? Hey, man, feel free to do what you're going to do. And hold on. What did it say? He also made him a large present in money and gave him leave to enter into conversation with the most learned among the Egyptians, from which conversation his virtue and his reputation became more conspicuous than that they had been before. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, look at this. Go ahead and look at this part uh, at two there. Go ahead, brother. Read that. All right. <clears throat> Four, whereas the Egyptians were formerly addicted to different customs uh, and despised one another's sacred and accustomed rites and were very angry one another, one with another on that account, Abram conferred with each of them and confuting the reasonings they made use of every one for their own practices. He demonstrated that such reasonings were vain and void of truth, whereupon he had he was admired by them in those conferences as a very wise man and one of great sagacity. When he discovered on any subject he undertook and this not only in understanding it but in persuading other men also to assent to him. He communicated to them arithmetic and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abraham, before, before Abram came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning. For that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt and from thence to the Greeks also. Mm. As soon as Abram was come back into Canaan, he parted the land between him and Lot upon account of the tumultuous behavior of their shepherds concerning the pastures wherein they should feed their flocks. However, he gave Lot his option or leave to choose which lands he would take. And he took himself what the other left, which were the lower grounds at the foot of the mountains. And he himself dwelt in Hebron, which is a city. Okay. No, nope, that's good. That's good. Now, this is out of the complete works of Josephus. Now, the reason that I went here once again, accept it or not, however you look at it, wherever your education background is, this would be a common, to some degree, however Josephus is explaining it, I'm, gonna, I'm under the impression, since he's supposed to be like little homie 
to Christ and John and them generation. Because once again, I believe I said that history has him being born around 10 CE. So when he was born, Christ would have been like John the Baptist was a few months older than Christ. They would have been like 17, 18, something like that. They would have been like 15, 16 years old at the time that Josephus was born, according to the tradition. So he's from, and, and, and people, jo Josephus is from the family of Kohath. He's from the same family that John the Baptist and his daddy from. So I'm, I'm, I'm only reading this to give you an idea. I'm not saying verbatim what is, what isn't, because I wasn't from that time. But it's clear that when we go and see the King Jehoshaphat calling Abraham God's friend, when we see James in his letter using the example of the Isaac story and saying Abraham was the friend of Elohim, I don't think men can just or should lightly make that statement. Where's your proof? What make you think that a man can be a friend to God? Because of God's love for him. So you come to the conclusion, man, God treated him like a friend. But I wanted to read some of the, the uh, 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 um, excuse me, some of the narrative from this mythos so that we could see that the way that the Hebrews went about uh, uh, um, talking about Abraham, it seems that there would have been this kind of, um, how can you say it? This narrative about their father that had much more um, substance to who the man Abraham was. Most of us wouldn't have no concept of Abraham to that depth. There is nothing in Genesis that had that would have my mind like, oh yeah, Abraham talked with people and told them about you know the Most High and this, that, and the third, and yeah, he was this kind of guy and he treated people like this. Was interesting. I don't have it today, but if you, I think the Jasher book gives a narrative of Abraham talking about how he treated how 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 of his wealth and substance. He always was a helper to those around him who were less fortunate. Now, this is interesting because if it's true, you know what that means, Kenny, about Abram in the Hebrews narrative of him? He was a man who always gave aid to people who weren't his flesh and blood. He was in a land that he was a stranger. He didn't even have, beside, and remember, him and Lot eventually separated, right? He didn't have near kinsmen. Abraham's family was made up of a, from the beginning, how do Hebrews miss this? These damn racist, flesh, self-proclaimed flesh and blood descendants of Abraham have none of his spirit. What do you mean, Zadok? Let's go, let's go back to the book now. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis. Ak. Wait, where am I? Okay. Let me back up. Let me back out of here. Right. Okay. So let's go to Genesis. I believe I want. Is it fifteen? It's going to be seventeen, I think. Yes. Go to Genesis seventeen, good brother. Let me share the screen. Okay, so now when Abraham is 99 years old, let's look at this. Uh, oh, Genesis 17, starting at one, when you got it, Ak. <clears throat> Genesis 17, one. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, as before me, 
Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Okay. And I no, no, hold on. I'm just going to back up right quick to chapter 15, and I want you to see what Abraham had said before. 15 and 1. 15 and 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Hold on. Wait, wait, hold on. No, continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And Abram said, Behold, to me the, thou hast given me no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Uh, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he shall come forth from out of thine own bowels, shall be thine heir. Okay, so, so what I want to establish here is that Abram finds himself in a scenario where he doesn't have a whole bunch of flesh, flesh and blood kinsmen and kinswomen around him as a stranger in this land see the book when the writer of hebrews talk about abraham living as a stranger it goes deeper than the fact that it, like because it says he dwelt in tents with uh, uh with isaac and jacob he didn't dwell with them alone isaac not born until 25 years into the journey of abraham in the land of canaan who, how was Abraham running around for almost three decades? What was his sense of family? Now, when he said, hold on, let me back up, actually. When he said this Eleazar of Damascus is the steward of my house. I'm going to read this right quick to you. Steward, the Hebrew word meshech. And it means uh, possession heir he who is to acquire the heir of my house the son of acquisition possession possessor of my house of my domestic property y'all know what this means he eliezer was to abraham what joseph was to potiphar it says that Joseph took so well care of Potiphar's business affairs and all the things over his house. Because remember, this is a precursor to the man of a higher authority in the land, the highest authority, Pharaoh. Basically, the legend claims Joseph was second in all of Egypt in his time to Pharaoh, right? Meaning that's how trusted he was, brethren. Y'all know he was that trusted by Potiphar. It says Potiphar. Joseph was so, wait, hold on. Let's go there. Let's go there. Let me get up. Uh, let me get up out of that young street. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go over to chapter, let me see, around 40, possibly. Joseph interprets the young ring ring. Okay. So Joseph is brought down in Egypt. Now look at this. So Joseph, verse four. Verse four, Genesis 39 and four. All right, 39 and four. Mm -hmm. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessings of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And hold on, hold on. This man trusted Joseph so much that he made him ruler over all his house and joseph 
it y'all it said it is to the point joseph was so trusted that all potiphar didn't have to worry about nothing all he knew is what was put on the table in front of him when he ate everything was taken care of this is how trustworthy an overseer he was to potiphar so this is the concept in my opinion of what a steward does now i want to show you all something else let's go back to the genesis narrative uh genesis 24 look at this verse 1 genesis 24 and 1 and Abram and Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Okay, that's it. So he's going to trust his eldest servant. Now, I don't know if this was still Eleazar or by this time, who knows, Eleazar could have died. And now it's kind of natural that his son, would possibly take over that position but the eldest servant of his house it, it, it hey kenny this is possible that it could have been the same guy he was telling god about right elazar oh. this man in charge of all my stuff whoever this is he sends this guy and i think many many of the racist hebrews can forget this so this man goes faithfully on this journey for abraham and look at what he says, verse 12, in the midst of his journey. Read verse 12. Verse 12. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let thine thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also, that the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And hereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. So praise God. Now, when it goes, how it goes, right? Look at this. When he's seen who he had got and she fulfilled, she, yo, he, this, I'm going to say this, this damn Gentile who is a part of Abraham's family prayed to the most high. He prayed to the same God that his master Abraham believes in. And if the narrative is true, then the legend would have the concept that Abraham converted people who came from other cultures around him out of Mesopotamia, all these servants he got out of Egypt. The Genesis narrative claimed he got all of these servants from Egypt. Then he got all of these servants from the king of Bimelech and whoever else he may have come into the land with originally. We know that this man was from Damascus and this ain't Damascus that was ran. Ain't no such thing as an Israelite at this time. So keep the concept. This I'm arguing that from the beginning, what many people might miss is that God used Abraham's belief in him. In the one true God, in the midst of all of these polytheistic cultures around him, that those who came close to him and became friends with him and lived under his order, it's more than likely they all converted to that God as well. He taught them about this God and they believed and they became one with Abram and lived under his authority and his order. And this Gentile, that's what I'm arguing. Who going to prove me wrong? This Gentile is praying to the same God that he's been taught by Abraham is the only God. And look at this. Once he asks God, see, you ain't got no problem with Gideon, the Israelite, praying to the Most High. Most High, uh, if you with me, uh, when I go outside in the morning, let the whole ground be wet and let this fleece I leave out here be dry. Most High, do it. Okay, Most High, you ain't got no problem with this Israelite. Now do it again one more time. Please don't be angry with the homie. Now, when I go outside again tomorrow, I want the I, I want the fleece to be wet, but all the ground around it dry. 
Most high blessing. Look at this man asked for something similar. He asked for this to go a specific way. And it went that way. And look at what the man did when it happened. Verse 26, bro. Genesis 24, 26. 26. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Wait, hold on. This Gentile in Abraham's house bowed his head and worshiped Yah. Continue. And he said, Blessed be the Lord of God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Okay, that's it. That's good enough. I want to go back to chapter 17. <sighs> okay. So now, the point that I'm making here, brother, wait, hold on, before I continue. Salute, I see a few more people came in. Forgive me for not paying a lot of uh, attention over here. Salute to Christina, how are you? My man, Natural, what up, Izzy? Uh, Laptop 7, salute. Deacon Steven, what's good with you, Brody? Of course, Mr. Blacktastic talking about uh, Abraham went to ancient Compton and Lot got caught up with the cane and Crips. Little Leon and them told me about this. This dude. <laughs> uh, snap. Salute, Yeshia. Uh, Brother Christopher, what's good with you? Ernest Higgs, salute, salute. Hey, y'all, welcome to the dojo. If you just joining, it's your brother, the God Hop MC. Got my brother, Kung Fu Kenny, in the building with me. And if when I call him Kung Fu Kenny, if y'all, just going back and look, when that man pop up with the... Uh, Big Trouble in Little China hat. You know what I mean? He ain't playing around. So check this out. He, wait, hold on. Before I even go there, let me say this. Share this out on your platforms if you've been edified by this tonight. Also, I ask you to consider if you're being edified and encouraged, if you consider to uh, support the ministry financially. Look at the ticker on the bottom of the screen. It gives you a few ways to do it. If you want to reach out for building purposes, my email address is available there as well. If you're listening in through the clubhouse, hit that greenhouse at the top. Become a, a member of the Bible Dojo Room on Clubhouse. And if you're looking to support the ministry financially or you want to reach out for building purposes, just check my bio and all the pertinent information is available there for you as well. So now, brethren, I'm arguing that Abraham is the friend of God because of his belief, but him being the father of the household of faith, y'all can't see why all the nations of the earth would be blessed in him because look at who he was in his life. I think many Hebrews missed this. And I don't know, maybe some Christians too. What? What is that, Zadok? From the beginning, Abraham's household, way before he was circumcised and way before he had his own son, according to the promise, Abraham was a man whose journey in obedience with God attracted other people who were not his flesh and blood, who came under his order, lived by his way. This steward of his house, this Gentile, Praise to Yah. And I'm also going to tell y'all this. Guess what? This Gentile was circumcised. How you know that, Zadok? Well, let's back up. We back in chapter 17. Genesis 17. He tells Abraham when he's 99 that, hey, I'm going to make this covenant and I'm going to give this to you, uh, this land to you and your seed for an everlasting possession. And he gives him the covenant of circumcision, right? So he's going to tell him starting around verse 11. Go ahead and read that, bro. He's going to give him details. Genesis we'll be... 17 and 11. 14? 17. 17 and 11. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. <clears throat> and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and that shall be a token of a covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. 
every man child in your generations he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised that shall soul shall be cut off from his people he hath broken my covenant now when you read in the torah law where the children of israel were given this same uh um, um custom and were told the same thing you see that the one who would be cut off would be an israelite because it says from among his from his people brethren those who were brought with abraham's money and those who were born in his house were his family he even said one born in my house is my heir you didn't have to be abraham's flesh and blood descendant ishmael wasn't even born at this time so what i'm telling you is is that when abraham received the covenant of circumcision it was only him and one relative of his own flesh that we can prove that got circumcised him and ishmael the overwhelming majority of men in abraham's family who got circumcised were not kin to him according to the flesh but were kin to him according to his faith that man that we read about in chapter 24 a few chapters later who goes and gets he's trusted he make an oath with abraham he knows how to pray to Yah. Yah hears this stranger. Because this, this stranger is actually a covenanted member of Abraham's household by faith, not by blood. All of those men that went with Abraham to go and get Lot back, 300 men out of his house. They were all circumcised. Lot didn't get saved by Abraham, the Hebrew, by himself. Lot got saved by a whole bunch of men that were not his relatives according to the flesh, but they were brothers according to the spirit. And they went with Abraham, putting their lives on the line to save the flesh and blood kinsmen of Abraham. This is the example of of the man who later on in the scripture is called the friend of God. Now, how many of us Hebrews are truly the friends of God? Let me show you something that the Most High had, <coughs> pardon me, that he had against the children of Israel and told them that they had gotten away from his ways and that they were lacking in judgment. Go to Malachi chapter three. Malachi three. And when we get to Malachi 3, we're going to start at verse 1. Malachi 3 and 1. This is of the utmost importance here, in my opinion. When you got a good brother, you could go ahead and read. All right, Malachi 3, 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner, a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He come into a refiner's fire is getting all the trash out of the precious metal. The fuller soap is going to clean something up. The dirtiest thing going to become the cleanest clean after it get done with that fuller soap. That's what this is saying. Go ahead, good brother. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So, then, so, so you got John the Baptist who is coming with the message. And then you also have Christ who is coming with the message. This is talking about them. Go ahead and look at this. Continue. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against, excuse me, <clears throat> the sorcerer. Maybe after. 
I will come. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside from the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Hold on, hold on. You would think a stranger ain't have no rights in Israel. According to these cats who are supposed to be representing us as people today, we hate the strangers according to what they are out here preaching. If you allegedly aren't an Israelite according to the flesh, you ain't nothing. They sound like Michael Jackson in the bad video when he was trying to cuss out Wesley Snipes in them in the subway. You ain't bad. You ain't nothing. <laughs> Who are, stop listening to these guys. They do not have the spirit of Hamashiach anywhere in their bodies. They are nothing like our father Abraham, a man who, as he walked this land, as he built his family and waited patiently as God slowly gave him glimpses of the promise that would come. This man made an entire household who was under covenant with Yah. And the majority of Abraham's family were not his flesh and blood relatives. That elder servant was not Abraham's relative in any provable way. What do you think Abraham did? He wasn't no damn oppressor. He didn't look at the stranger as any suffering I go through. It's your fault. Because I was scared in Egypt, once Pharaoh gave me these man servants and women servants, y'all under my boot, damn it. I'm Abraham. I know y'all. Y'all don't. Shut up, sucker. Do what I told you. You don't get that impression. Now, if he the master, I'm pretty sure that they served him. Lovely, but Christ is master. Is he an oppressor to us? See, people get that term in the biblical, especially when we read like these King James versions and we're reading this old Victorian English. We get all hyped over master, servant. They going to serve us. Yeah. They going to come to your country and serve you willingly because they're going to have a better life. They're not going to be oppressed in your country. Because they're the hewers of your wood and drawers of your water. Do you know you got Mexican, Colombian, Guatemalan, uh, uh, Salvadorian immigrants who will come to the United States? They will sneak their damn way into this place if they got to. And they will come here and cut grass. They'll work in the almond fields. They'll work on, they will work on the farms. They will landscape. They stand outside the Home Depot. Hey, I work. I work. I'll never forget the first time I went to Washington, D.C. Because where I'm from in upstate New York, they're not in huge numbers up here. Man, when I was in Washington, D.C. and me and my friend went to the Home Depot one morning, y'all, it was like 25, 30 Mexican brothers out there. I'm bugging. I said, yo, bro, why all these uh, Mexicans out here? He said, oh. They come out here because they know the construction companies pull up here all day. And these guys want to work. And they'd they be like, and, and I'll never forget it because I'm, I'm amazed, y'all. And some of you might be used to this. I'm not. they like, hey, we'll work. I, I work. I work. Guys standing out there, man, y'all. What I'm saying is these people come here and they become the people who will what? They will cut your grass. They'll feed you burritos. They will sell you oranges by the side of the road. And they will, they got a plan for their family because your land offers them opportunity. They don't come here and run everything. They come here and they serve America. And some of y'all may not really get that concept in your head. You go to the grocery store and, oh, I, I love my organic vegetables and you love your fruit. I'm telling you, if you're in America, 90% of us who love strawberries, almond milk, 
almonds, <laughs> oranges, kiwi, grapes, corn. You like your tofu? I'm telling you, people from South America who are willing to come here and serve the rest of us in this country in that manner doing what 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 in society is kind of considered like the the introductory bottom of the rung jobs walk drawing water in ancient israel cutting wood down for fire getting water out the rivers and the wells for you helping build your houses helping farm your land that's what the stranger among you was willing to do because the land was yours by inheritance so of course they got to come and work under you but you were not to be their oppressor and the most high people want to run to you. Tell these Hebrews the next time they ask a so-called Israelite like myself. Um, hey, bro. So why did the most high kick the children of Israel and Judah out of the land? Oh, well, we served other gods and we got caught up in the cultures of the other people. Yeah, the Most High also said in Malachi 3 that y'all kept the stranger from his rights and see what the hell they tell you the stranger's rights were according to the law. Brethren, I'm telling you right now, many of us have been taught a limited view of Abraham and his credential. And so that's why tonight we read some of the mythos coming out of Josephus and stuff like that, showing you some of what would probably have been common education among the Hebrews of his day. I believe that what we read about Abraham is more than likely what Christ and would have been taught about Abraham growing up all their life. That whole that this would have been the Pharisees tradition because Josephus is a he was a Pharisee like Paul. And he was from the family of Kohath. Like I said, he's the next generation after John the Baptist and Zechariah. These are facts. So when we read his claim and he give all of this substantive info on who Abraham was, brethren, whether you believe it all or not, that's on you. But I'm just saying the narrative has merit. And if you can see that, now you can see in James' letter why he says Abraham was the friend of God. You can see why Jehoshaphat the king, when he prayed for the most high to have mercy, he said, will you not have mercy on us? We're the seed of Abraham, your friend. Look at the quality it claimed he had. Brethren, our, it, when, when you think of Israelite, do you think of a people who are covenanted, who are the, the, the people of God, allegedly? And the way that they're willing to preach and evangelize about the one true God and whoever they deal with out of other nations that turn unto that same God, they treat them like brother and sister. I'm telling y'all, some of these cats are so wicked that when they read in the Torah that if one from among a stranger got circumcised, then he was to be treated as one born in the land, one law for the stranger who is under the covenant and the Israelite born. You know what come to their mind? Meaning as soon as that stranger do something wrong, you judge him. Nothing about loving that stranger. Nothing about looking at this non-Israelite according to the flesh as a brother or a sister. You love these people. That ain't in their mind. They hate. They hate. They, they stuck in this one third. They only love one third of some imaginary group of people and they put themselves as being the ones who gonna execute. Man, look, I'm gonna let you. I'm just gonna let y'all know. Ain't nobody worried about these dudes, man. Ain't nobody worried about these guys. The American government ain't worried about them. Ain't no hoods in the United States worried about these guys. Not like y'all gonna come through, which y'all gonna put down everybody. Look, the majority of people ain't listening to y'all, which y'all gonna fight all the gangs. Y'all gonna kill all the gangs. Because remember, in our communities, all of these bloods, a lot of these bloods, Crips, gangster disciples, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, all of these different GDs, and y'all know all of this stuff we hear 
in gang culture. You go into all any state USA, any city USA, all in Memphis, all of these places. Y'all mean to tell me y'all really think that these Israelites gonna run up in these places and chop down all of these cats who ain't listening to them because the most high is going to take us, excuse us, is going to take us uh, and, and, and he's gonna give us reign over, look, most high ain't told you you was gonna do nothing in nobody land. You can't read anywhere in the scripture where besides the time in the book of Esther where the children of Israel did anything to anybody while they were in their enemy's land. No, he's just saying, I'm going to take you from your enemy's land and put you back in yours. So even the narrative is totally unbiblical. They got it like they're going to be all over there, which I go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. OK. So, brethren, look, I'm just letting you all know that the concept of Abraham being God's friend, I believe it comes from a deeper place than just the Isaac narrative briefly mentioned in James' letter. He was letting you know the purpose of James' letter when he mentioned Abraham was to see, you do see how his works, but he only mentioned one work. You see how his works mixed with his faith is what justified him. So faith without works is dead. He said works, plural, but he only mentioned the Isaac narrative. So, Kenny, when he used the word works, it would make you think that, oh, so if we go into Abraham's narrative, let's look at the various things of righteousness that Abraham did in all of these works mixed with his belief. He was only in Canaan because he believed God, right? And when it says when he believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness, right? So now the way he treats all of these people from these different ethnicities who become servants to him in his household. Abraham, by the time he didn't even have more kids until after Sarah died. And the scripture tell us that when Sarah, when Sarah died, if I'm not mistaken, the Bible gives us the narrative that Isaac was in his 40s. So him and Lot been separated. Ishmael eventually got sent off. Abraham done, is living out. His belief in the most high, but let me see, 75, the scripture got Abraham dying at what? Did he die at like 175 or something like that? I think it might have him dying at 175. Let me see right quick. Because when you think about it, it's utterly profound to me, at least. Some people might be like, bro, you just trying to find something deep to talk about. Yeah, right. whatever. I found it. Is that what it say? Yes, sir. Google came. Yup. And, I, and I these are the days I, of the years of Abraham's life. A hundred, three score and 15 years. Y'all know what that mean? For 100 years, in order for Abraham to survive in that land by Yah's grace, he went in the land. He had Ishmael when he was 86, right? That means for 11 years, he walked around and beside Sarah in Lot, and then he separated from Lot, his own servants. All of them, when he came into covenant with God, his son Ishmael now is like 13 when Abraham was 99. Ishmael and Abraham out of the hundreds of men that are Abraham's household, two of them, we can confidently call Hebrews because Ishmael was a Hebrew, no matter if you want to accept it or not. So you got Abraham, the Hebrew, his son, Ishmael, the Hebrew. Who is all these other uncircumcised Negroes? Cats from everywhere else. This is Abraham's household. From the beginning and in the very back end, this is Abraham's household. This is why the apostles can confidently say, "Those who are of the flesh are not the children of are not the children of the promise." Meaning, you could be his relative. Ishmael was his relative, according to blood. All of Keturah's sons were his children, according to blood. But Isaac was his son, 
not merely by blood, but by blood and promise. So Israelites who are going to be really considered a part of Abraham's household for real will be of the blood, of course, because they're Israelites according to the flesh. But they also going to have to get in by the promise. And that promise is by the belief and acceptance in Hamashiach. And then the scripture lets us know the most high is gathering people from other nations to him. Isaiah 56 confirms that. Unto the son of the stranger. You can't go and try to make that son of the stranger somebody from the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom. It don't fit. It's a doctrine straight out the pits of damn Tataris, Sheol, Hades, and any other word on earth that means hell. Abraham died 175 years old. So, Kenny, you know what that tell me? Ah, that means bro walked around for 100 years a century and the majority of who served him and were converted to his God and were the people of the covenant before there was a nation of Israel was Abraham, a couple of flesh and blood descendants of his surrounded by a great crowd of Gentiles who were in covenant with Elohim under Abraham. And this would be my last text for the night. Let's go to Matthew 8. Go to Matthew 8. Look at what, and Yeshua warns us, and I'm just letting you know. Oops, fell away. The devil is alive. In the words of the great prophet Rick Ross, the devil is a lie. So check this out. Here we go. Matthew 8. Let me share the screen. I hit something by accident. And it took me back. I thought I was going to the Bible app and it took me out of um, took me out of the stream for a minute. Matthew 8. All right. So when we get here, I, let's look at this. Matthew 8. And five. Matthew 8, 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do and this do this, and he doeth it. Mm -hmm. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no not in Israel. Now, I'm going to, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. I'm going to put it out there that you have those who like to put out there the possibility. See, they make this centurion to be, uh, um, hold on. They make this centurion to be an Israelite. Cornelius is an Israelite. Uh, this centurion got to be some Israelite. Um, when you talk about the Syrophoenician woman, they want to run the Zechariah where it says the Canaanite shall be destroyed out of the land. But it called her a woman of Canaan because she lived in the area. If you go and look up her pedigree, they let you know she was not Canaanite by blood. They this these are just the writers a woman of canaan meaning she came out of that country just like you had simon the canaanite who was one of jesus homies it wasn't calling him a canaanite because he was literally canaanite by blood it's so bad a doctrine but what i'm saying is if you look at it they're making the concept to be uh uh um Hold on. Hold on for a second here. Because I think I may have found what I want. Hold on. What you ordering? Door dash. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, goodness, dude, you way too much, dog. Hold on for a second. Uh, hold on. Nope, nope, nope. Hold on. Okay, hold on, hold on, everyone. Please be patient. I just want you. Okay, so hold on. Okay. All right. This is what I was looking for. Before we go to Matthew 5, let me share this with you. Let me stop sharing the screen. I want to go to this little Wikipedia joint right quick and let's look at let's look at centurions right quick. Because what happens is, like, do you know what it takes to be a centurion? You just they, they act like yo, that's like saying this man was a a, a, a colonel. In, in in the in, in the U.S. Marines or something. Well, in ancient Rome, what would that have looked like? Oh, that was an Israelite, really? You think there were a lot of Israelites who rose to the rank of centurion in in, in during imperial Rome? You talking about? Let's go look at something, brethren. Let's check this out right quick. Here we go. So, here we go. So you got the centurion. Um, here, can you see this, good brother? Yeah, I got it up on my iPad. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, start right there where it says a centurion. A centurion was a position in the Roman army during classical antiquity, nominally the commander of a century a military unit of agent of 80 legionnaires in a Roman legion centuries were grouped into cohorts commanded by their senior most centurion. The prestigious first, first cohort was led by the primus pilus, pri, primus pilus, the most, uh -huh. senior, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the most senior yeah. centurion in the legion and its third in command. A centurion symbol of office was the vine staff. Um, but before I say that, I do want to know what a legionary is. What's a what's a legionaries? Because it sounds oh, like, uh, like he's the leader of a person who is in charge of more people. You, you see mean? it right there. A Roman legionary was a professional heavy infantry man of the Roman army after the Marian reforms. These okay. soldiers would conquer and defend the territories of ancient Rome during the late Republic. Mm -hmm. Got you. So that's just a single person. So still so just okay. Still, that's still heavy though. Eighty people. Okay. All right. Um. All right. Let me see. Minimizing. It's not the way. Okay. There we go. A centurion symbol was the office. Uh, of office was the vine staff, with which they disciplined even Roman citizens. I'm were, telling you right now, a centurion and the power they had, you had to be a free man. You weren't going to be a slave and be a Roman centurion, which is why it's 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 highly improbable. I'm not saying impossible, but unless that unless that centurion, if he was a Jew by blood, was considered a free Roman man, he was no centurion. I mean, he was no no Jew people. A Roman centurion would be a free man to be of this rank to have the authority under the Roman Senate to punish even Roman citizens. You cannot, you, you weren't going to be no non-Roman and have the power to punish Roman citizens. A centurion was not some low level. This was a man at a minimum who had control of at least a hundred men under him. This is why this guy telling Jesus, look, man, I'm not worthy. Why? Because brethren, what they want, what they don't want to bring as a historical fact is that you had many Gentiles who had an affinity. They had respect 
unto the way of the Hebrews. They just weren't Hebrews themselves. Y'all, do y'all understand that Alexander the Great himself, according to history, had great honor unto the culture of the Hebrews and other cultures that he felt were more ancient than his own? The the When you read, yo, read the complete works of Josephus when he talk about how when uh when, when the first time the Greeks came into Jerusalem and Alexander the Great came into the city and saw the temple and the Levites in them had this whole elaborate situation set up and and Josephus claims they even showed him in the writing of the Daniel prophet that their God had long ago told them of his coming and he did honor to God and prayed before the temple and they made sacrifices on his behalf the levites did hey y'all uh, okay whatever whether you believe it or not i wasn't there y'all wasn't there but it is what it is oh hold on my bro went out oh there you go okay you back kenny all right so kenny we're gonna continue bro where it says uh uh centurions also served <clears throat> centurions also served in the roman navy after the 107 BC Marian reforms of Gaius Marius, centurions were professional officers. Y'all, keep, no, keep going. I don't want to talk too much. Oh. In late antiquity and the Middle Ages, the Byzantine army's centurions were also known by the name Kenny Kentarch. Okay. Keep, no, keep going. Kenny Kentarch. All right. All right, so we started at the centurions. Wait. Oh, okay. no, no, no. I don't want to read all of this. People can go and read all of this stuff on their own, but I want to stop. I want to go down here um, under role where, where it talks about centurions could be elected. All right, give it a second to catch up here. Centurions could be elected. All right, give me one second. My bad, the delay. All right, so centurions could be elected, appointed by the Senate, or promoted from the ranks for a variety of reasons. Julius Caesar is said to have promoted his centurions for displays of valor. Historians cite examples of them being the first over the enemy's wall or through the breach. The various centurion grades may be loosely compared to modern, junior, and middle grade officers. Below the centurions were the option known, optionists, second, seconds in command of centuries. Brethren, I'm telling you that if this Jew, if this centurion was a Jew, like some guys be claiming in their bad doctrine, in my opinion, he would have been a traitor. He would have been a traitor. He would have been looked at by Jews as a traitor because of what he got to give his life to the Roman Empire. You're already a soldier and you're going to be valiant. It take a lot to become a centurion in the ancient Roman army. And I'm telling you that for the most part, the Roman army under, especially in the time of time, the time of Pontius Pilate, they were made up brethren of majority almost majority foreigners and a centurion just is not this low rank anybody can be a centurion and so this that look man it, it just was not that um but at, but at any rate i want to go down and hold on where we at where we at the qualities necessary to be a centurion go ahead all right. Here it is. The qualities nece necessary to be a centurion. You want me to read the highlighted part too? Centurions yeah. had to be okay. Centurions had to be literate to be able to read and write written orders, uh, have connections, letters of recommendations, be at least 30 years of age, and have already served a few years in the military. They also have had to be able to boost their soldiers' morale. Mm -hmm. the the centurion in the infantry is chosen for his size, strength, and dexterity in throwing his missile weapons and for his skill in the use of his sword and shield. In short, for his expertness in all 
the exercises. He is to be vigilant, temperate, active, and readier to execute the orders he receives than to talk. Strict in exercising and keeping up proper discipline amongst his soldiers and obliging them to appear clean and well-dressed and to have their weapons constantly rubbed and bright. Mag so, brethren, I, I just wanted to go here. You go look up some more stuff on your own. I'm telling you, because Roman um, uh, centuries were made up of free Roman citizens, it's highly unlikely that a Jew from an impoverished, lower class people, Jews were not Roman citizens. Did y'all know that? Now, maybe from some Jews, some Jews from the diaspora or from some wealthy families or something, they could possibly find themselves being Roman citizens in another part. So maybe guys, maybe in that way, the 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 the, the Jewishness of this Roman centurion is possible, but it's highly unlikely because especially if you got a century that got free Roman males in it who are just stationed by order to go to a place like Palestine and be under orders to be there to put down riots, it's highly unlikely that you were going to have a Jew in that position. That's why I don't believe Cornelius nor this man were Israelites at all. So, I, you know, people can say, well, that's conjecture. Well, if it is, it's as much conjecture as what is being taught as literal doctrine. Literal doctrine. <laughs> now, let's go back to Matthew 8. And so this centurion, who I'm arguing, more than likely was no Israelite at all. He was a stranger, but he, hey, he believed. And so when he showed this kind of faith, and told Yeshua, man, I, yo, man, basically, I believe you can just say it and it'll happen. You ain't got to come under my roof, man, because the kind of person I am, I wouldn't even, I feel unworthy for a man of you, like you to come under my roof. I'm a man of violence, man. I, I'm running soldiers. I'm I'm being mean to cats. Go do this. Go do that. Go. That's why I wanted to read what we just saw there to get an idea of what a centurion was and what it took to be one. Go ahead and look at what Yeshua says. Verse 10. Mm. Uh, when Jesus marveled, he said, um, uh, yeah, so we said, uh, we have not found so great faith in Israel. And I say unto you that many no, shall no, no, come. No, 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 uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Start that over, bro. Verse I'm 10. sorry. Because right. we had already read 10, so I thought you meant yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, start it over. I got yeah. you. I got you. So when Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he said to them that followed, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Bre and brethren, I that's how we know this man in Israel. Man, look at this man's faith. I'm telling you, brothers, and among our people, I have found nobody as faithful as that man. Y'all know what that means? That even who he was talking to, he's telling them that's the, that's, that's the kind of faith I'm looking for. Accept it or not, brethren. Go ahead, bro. Verse 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. Now look at how Yeshua takes the faith of a non-Israelite in comparison to Israelites who he's here to save if they would damn listen and he say hey i'm telling y'all many are gonna come from other places and they're gonna sit down with abraham isaac and jacob who are they all men of faith who believed in the promise of god that stranger believed in what god could do for him through christ he didn't even to the point you ain't even got to come to my house man i know if you say it it's there and Yeshua was like, yo, man, I haven't found this kind of faith in, not at, in Israel at all. That's what he's saying. Many like him, non-Israelites, who have what? Faith. You see why he used Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because Abraham is the father of faith. 
I'm telling you that faith is going to get people from other places who are going to sit in the presence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the children of the kingdom, meaning what? His children according to the flesh, like all the Israelites, many of the children who are the flesh and blood descendants, they're going to be cast into outer darkness. They won't get to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. They're going to be cast out. That's what he's telling you. Remember, Abraham had children of his flesh who were sent away from Isaac. Ishmael was sent away from Isaac. Keturah's five sons, Midian and all of them, were sent away from Isaac to show even if you're related to Abraham, if you're not of the promise, you're kind of separated. So brethren, this is what we who would claim to be Israelites, who would claim to be Christians or Nazarenes, whatever you want to say, understand that if you think you being a, a descendant of Abraham is enough, be warned. No. Abraham's credentials to be Yah's friend, the way Abraham set an example that others from other places would be willing to follow and come under covenant. That's why the most high, when he set up Israel, told them, hey, this is how you deal with the stranger. He want to come keep covenant and to the point he going to get circumcised. And then, man, you treat him like you like you treat yourself. That's the kind of pedigree that God's friends have. So whoever in here would think they would be a friend of God, look at Abraham a little bit closer and don't just get caught up in the simple narrative of, oh, he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. I, and you know why I say that? Because it's more than likely, it says that Abraham and them went on and he looked at his servants and told them, hey, y'all chill here, me and my son gonna go forward up to the mountain. Brethren, those servants who were with Abraham and Isaac, they were circumcised and they weren't Hebrews. That's all I got to say. So I'm going to end tonight's presentation there. Abraham, the friend of Elohim. I'm hoping and praying that there was some edification for all of you in it. Just me getting a chance to say it edified me. I'm encouraged. I want to be more like the friend of God. What you think, Kenny? Anything you want to say before we get out of here, good brother? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna say a little something this time because uh it was definitely a dope chop and build. Um, but I thought it was uh, uh I thought it was real dope because um and I'm not pushing back on anything that Black Tastic said, but he was trying to highlight the fact that you said something about it being mythos, and I get it, you know. Some people think that it might be inspired words, some people think it might not be, you know what I mean, when you're looking at you know, the Flavius Josephus and whatever and your books of Jashers. But just in I'm 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 like up to like chapter 60 of the book of Jasher right now. And Genesis just makes way more sense when I read these writings that were familiar to them, whether they were myth or whether they were legend and exaggerated or not. Like when you start reading these things. Uh, and you understand what the oral tradition was and what the, the presuppositions were that they may not have been stating in some of the things that they were writing in the Bible. It really just kind of illuminates um, a lot of things that were in the text. Because like somebody said earlier, I think it was Dre. Brother Dre says something about um, the fact that, you know, it, it's, it seems like like when, like when you're reading Genesis, it's almost like this mysterious shadow of righteousness that's following behind him. And you're like, but what did he do? You feel me? But like, as we're reading it right now, man, it's almost like Abraham was like the first John the Baptist. Like my man was like, yo, my man, he was, he put his wife away. It, 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 seeing the contrast between him being like, all right, look, I'm not willing to die for you being my wife. Right. So you go on ahead and you just say you're my sister, but he was willing to die for going out in front of all of these people who don't want to hear nothing new, but he out there just, you know what I mean? Just banging on him with what the word was. So it was just, it's really dope just to see um, all of these other writings, man, and, and, and seeing it kind of come together. You know what I mean? Like, like if we believe, you say it all the time, if we believe that a, 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 a child could be born of a virgin, why can't we believe that 
an angel came to Joseph and taught him all 70 languages in one night. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, they, they two sides of the same coin. You feel me? So it's, it's, it's all good stuff, man. And I love it. And I think it was a good night for me to be on the read with you, man. Cause uh, I appreciate it, stuff, bro. Hey, hey, I mean, I, I can't argue with because at the end of the day, it's like, look, we, we in a book talking about a damn donkey talk to a dude, man. I mean, I, I mean, look, if you whatever you want to rank on, we running around. OK, well, in the book of numbers, a donkey talk to a nigga. <laughs> That's what we claim it. Who ain't claiming it? Huh? Back. We our our belief system for those of us who are uh, believers in Yeshua being Yosef of Nazareth, being the chosen Mashiach prophesied in the text. We running around telling the whole world we believe a man rose from the dead and is in the heavens right now. That's what, like, at the end of the day, so I hear what you're saying. And that's why it's on every person to judge. And, yes, I call it mythos, understanding that this was part of their tradition. But it don't mean that all the tradition was a lie. That's not what mythos mean. Mythos don't mean a lie. Mm. Because the Sadducees, it was things that were, 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 were verily integral to the Israelite culture that the Sadducees rejected. The book of Esther is the last, allegedly is the last book even added to what we call the Old Testament. And the and when you go and do the study on why it had a difficult time making it, yo, the book of Daniel was an issue for a long time. The Israelites didn't really know how to accept it and where to put it. So when I say mythos, I'm just saying it in the context of there are things that were common among them as stories. Now, of course, it's on people to believe it or not. But I'm just telling you that they definitely had stuff that was a part of their education and teaching. You put it like this, bro. There's stories in American history, like for most of us who went to school. Y'all, most of y'all remember them paintings of George Washington and them guys going over, taking that nighttime trip over the Delaware River and they, they like on the boat in the middle of the Delaware and George Washington standing up all regal looking on the paint. You remember you, ever, you remember seeing that Kenny as a kid? Uh, yeah. Now you know in real life it, it, they was cold as hell in the middle of the winter crossing the Delaware for a sneak attack on the British army. Mm. George Washington and them would have been huddled in those boats. But the mythos is what? George Washington, the leader, in the middle of the night, standing up on a canoe with his eyes forward on the mission. That's the idea. George Washington on a white horse. You would have never knew from any of them pictures that George Washington had wooden dentures in his lip. Mm. So what I'm saying is, is that the context of mythos means you got legend built around the mothers and fathers. But remember, all oral tradition ain't a lie. It's just some things. You, you just got to ask the, the Ruach to guide you at the end of the day. Because what would have been the mythos on who Abraham was to the children of Israel in Egypt? What would have been the stories that Jacob told about his... um about his grandfather possibly was he did he even get to meet his granddad like that you know what i'm saying yeah but more than likely it's possible that he got to see his granddad what did his dad isaac tell him about his dad about his granddad that as jacob tell about who they are and why they in this land he got to pass some stories on to his 12 sons what do them 12 sons tell their sons? And so on and so on and so on. So I'm not the person who's going to say, because it's mythos, it's fake. But I just understand mythos sometimes can have embellishment to it. And who knows what might be. Uh, nah, that ain't happened, bro. But that's not for me to call. But I'm going to tell you this. The reason why I read the Abraham narrative tonight is because I ain't really got no problem with it. There is nothing in it that takes away from my perception of Abraham. But when we read the scriptures, I'm telling you that Christ in them in his day and those in the nation before him would not have merely been relying on the book of Genesis to tell them who Abraham was. I do believe that with all sincerity. So 
with that being the case, brethren, Abraham, the friend of God, I pray that tonight you got some edification from what I chose to share. And may y'all continue to lead us all into truth because that's really what it's about at the end of the day. You know what I mean? It's about that young truth. It ain't about uh, 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 just how we want things to be. It's about the things that cause us to sit, consider, and meditate on the scripture. And if you decide, like my bro just told y'all, he reading the book of Jasher right now. Cool. I don't know what he going to take out of the book of Jasher or not. I, I'm not sure. You know what I'm saying? But I, I'll tell you this. There are things in our New Testament that let me know whether we believe they got it out of books that were written in their day or oral traditions. There's a couple things in the New Testament. There's a couple statements in the New Testament that got to come from something. It, it don't come out of at least what we have as our written Old Testament. I'm sorry. Whoever can't admit that, we would have to conversate about that. Because there's clearly some things that come out of traditions that are not common among us in church culture today. That was so much, um, like, put it like this. Eve, I, I'll just give y'all one. The book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Who, the writer of Jude says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied this. You not getting that out the book of Genesis. Why should we believe the writer of Jude that Enoch said any damn thing? where that come from? That come from mythos. But it's in our Bible. It's, it's spoken as second nature. But, but see, notice this. The writer of Jude spoke about Enoch prophesying and telling us what Enoch said as clearly as that same person named Cain and Balaam. We ain't got no problem with Cain and Balaam. How, how, how the hell we know Enoch said, God, the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee to judge the ungodly and sinners for all the ungodly deeds they committed. How we, who, who gonna corroborate that? Where'd that come from? When it says, just as Janus, and Jambres withstood Moses to the face, at least in modern narrative, one of the only places that we can find those names written is actually in the book you claiming to read right now. It's written in their names are all in the Jasher book, all through there. And guess what? In the Jasher book, it claimed that Janus and Jambres were the sons of Balaam, the sorcerer of claim. They were Midianites who, because of their expertise, got high rank in Egyptian society. Did you know that? That's in the Jasher book. So if whoever is writing in the New Testament book can just say, just as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses to the face. Y'all, do y'all know how flabbergasted I was when about 15 years ago, I'm asking homies, I say, yo, who is Janus and Jambres? We was like, we don't know. None of my bros knew. So we went on an odyssey and found out allegedly these are the names of the two sorcerers in Egypt that when Moses threw his stick on the ground and it turned into a snake, they threw their sticks down and it turned into snakes. When Moses turned water to blood, they turned water to blood. That's Janus and Jambres. And what? An Israelite mythos. You won't find their names written. Somebody go and show me Janus and Jambres written in the book of Genesis. I'm sorry, in the book of Exodus. Won't find it. Somebody go show me Enoch, anything Enoch said in Genesis chapter five. It don't exist. So we got to be careful with how we treat mythos. Both ways. Balance. That's why I was confident to share some of the mythos with y'all tonight. I'll let you all do with it what you will. But it got to be clear to y'all, at least this particular one, what I'm doing with it. <laughs> so with that being the case, Shabbat Shalom to you Sabbath keepers. I pray that you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. And for those of you to tuning in who are believers, but you may not recognize the Sabbath as a day that you rest. I still pray that the peace of y'all be with you and that your understanding grows. Hallelujah.
Appreciate y'all. Most High Willing will be on Sunday night getting some Kung Fu in. Open dojo. Y'all know what that means, right? You come and you ask questions and make statements. And the topic will be what you want to talk about. So I liked how last week went. For the second week in a row, Most High Willing, we're going to concentrate on questions from the audience. But not alone. But I'm going to make sure I start off with a couple questions for the audience before my homies who decide to hit that link and come talk live on stage um, come in and we dominate the conversation. And I start to totally ignore the chat. I'll I, I be like, oh, man, I think I'm treating the folk bad. So, yeah, y'all, that's what it is. Most high bless y'all until next time. Nate, you already know what it is, bro. 